uh, I want to now I want to jump into God's word. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we've been we've been studying uh, through the Sermon on the Mount and we're learning uh, the words of Jesus in red. And we're getting to go up and ascend the mountain of the Lord and sit at Jesus feet as he preaches a sermon and teaches us about human flourishing, how we're to live. And that's amazing. But this week, I'm taking a little bit of a break because, like I said, when I'm just the messenger, but when God gives me a message, I have to pass it on to you. And so I got a message, and it was just like, and it, you know, you do this long enough, the messages come from all these crazy different places. So this, this message was totally different. Like, I am, I'm sitting at home at night with Meredith, and we're going into the kids' room to read them their, their Bible story before bed in prayer time, right? And, and so she, Meredith opens up the little children's Bible, you know, the little adventure, whatever it is, cartoon thing. And she's reading this story about, if you know church, if you've been in church, you know your Bible, you've heard these names. If not, I'll do my best to explain. But there's, this, there's these two prophets. There's Elijah with a J and then Elisha. That's his, like his assistant, the guy who moves in and kind of takes over the task after Elijah retires. So, so there's those guys, and so Meredith is reading this story out of the children's Bible, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, man, that's powerful right there, right, out of the children's Bible. I'm like, that's powerful right there. And I started thinking about it, I'm like, man, I, I need to hear that story, I need to hear the, the, the real version of that story, because that's super powerful, the story of, of Elijah kind of coming to the end of his ministry for God, and he's, and he's calling Elisha to come and step into ministry, into the work of the Lord, and listen, I just told you that there's the work of the Lord that's needed around here, so super apropos, I didn't see that coming, but, but God did, and so here we are, I want to do, do me a favor, um, I want to read the story of Elijah's call, it's in 1 Kings chapter 19, grab a Bible please, and turn there. And I'm going to read it out loud. And it's only three verses. It looks a little longer than that, but it's three verses, this story. I want to read that to you. And we'll, we'll, we'll pick it apart. And, and I believe it's a powerful message. It's impacted me. It was a, like when she read it, it was like, wham, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And so I went to the, to the Bible and, and I read the story. And, and here's the story. You guys ready for the story? It's, I'm sorry, uh, 1919, 1 Kings 1919. Thanks for caring, man. That's an awesome church right there. Good deal. All right, y'all ready for this? All right, here we go. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, like he already knew what this guy what was happening. He didn't ask him, what did you just do? What did you just do? Okay. He knew. He knew. And we'll get to that in a minute. He says, first let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye and then I will go with you. See, he was being what? Called. He was being called. He was being called to... to to kingdom work. He says, first let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, he's like, okay, cool, right? He says, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. Like, don't just turn and walk away. No, I want you to think about this calling that you just received. Consider it. Think about it, okay? Verse 21. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them, he used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. Most translations won't say then he went. It says after the dinner, then he arose and went and ministered with Elijah. So, listen, this is an awesome, powerful story, and it might not have hit you between the eyes yet, but I believe that it will. I believe that it will. But listen, before we dive into the story and pick it apart, you, you have to look at Elisha's resume following this. Because if it's not an impressive calling on display, then it's no reason to follow it, right? So if it's a powerful message, it's because what he did was so amazing and the results were so amazing that if you do it, then it'll be amazing for you too. Then it's powerful. If it's, if it's just something you memorize or go, that's a cool story, 
then that's nothing. And if nothing happens as a result of this story in Elisha's life, then it's not worthy to be followed. So let's talk a little bit about Elisha. Elisha, in, in, in 2 Kings chapter 4, this is a couple of stories. In 2 Kings chapter 4, he has so many things that happen in that one chapter. It's crazy. So here's the first thing. So there's this lady, and her husband dies, and he was the breadwinner, and she doesn't have any money to pay her bills. And so she's got some debts, and her kids, right, there, there's nothing there. The debt collector's like, okay, you don't have any money, so I'll come get your kids. And so, the, so, so Elisha goes to the house and says, ma'am, like, what do you have? You know, she doesn't have any money. So she says, well, I have this one little flask of, of oil. And he's like, all right, cool. So, so I want you to do this. I want your kids to go out and get a, a bunch of jars, right? I want you to go get a, you have a flask, but I want you to go get a bunch of jars and, and that's probably not this big, but let's just use an example. A bunch of jars, and, 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 and don't get a few. Like, go get a bunch of them, right? So they go and they get a bunch, and so what he does is he takes the little flask of oil, and he pours it into here. And it keeps pouring until this is full. Like, the oil is worth money, right? So, he, so God is supernaturally, through Elisha, producing... Um, finances for this woman, right? And so she takes it, she fills it up, and this, look, there's still oil right there, right? So she grabs another one, and she goes and she grabs the little flask of oil, sorry, and, and she takes it and, 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 and starts pouring it here, right? And, and it keeps flowing, and it fills this one up, and she puts it aside, and then she grabs another, right? And this just keeps going, and God, through Elijah, is providing for this woman in a way that that we, oh, we never expected to, but when that thing happens in your life and you're like, well, I can't believe that he did that. This is what's going on right here for this lady, right? So all of a sudden, they get to the last jar, and it fills to the top. And when they went like this, oh, it's empty. How about that on the last jar? How many people think that if there was more jars, there'd be more oil? Right, right? There would be. So, so, so the only limitation sometimes we put on God is us. But, so that's what happens there, right? So God uses him to perform this amazing miracle there with this woman. So does that. Then in 2 Kings chapter 2, <laughs> Elisha, I like this. I like, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Elisha is a bald prophet. <laughs> right? Oh, no, he's a bald prophet. And, and, so what <laughs> and so what happens is it says that there was these kids going down the road. And, this, and the bald prophet, Robert, love for you, right? Right here, bald prophet, right? And so, 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 the, so the, he's going down the road, and these kids, these little snot-nosed punk kids, right? So they come out, and they're like, hey, Baldy, Baldy, get out of here. Get out of here, Baldy. He's like, oh, really? So he sa it says that he put a curse on them. And immediately, immediately, when he cursed them, two bears come running out of the woods and maul all those kids. That's Can you do that? That was awesome, right? I love that story. It gives me hope. <laughs> then there's this woman in 2 Kings chapter 4. Great chapter. She wants a baby. She's got no baby. She's going a little bit old. And her husband, um, let's just say he's, not, he's, he's past the time of being actively involved in the creation process. That's it, okay? And so... She's like, yeah, I don't have a kid. I don't have a kid. I want a kid. And so Elisha declares the miracle that God is going to give her a child. And a year from now, you're going to have a child. And guess what? A year from now, guess what happens? She has a kid, right? So then the kid grows up. He's working out in the field with his dad. And all of a sudden, he gets a massive migraine, right? It says, you just read it. Gets this massive migraine. Oh, my head, my head hurts. My head hurts. Kind of passes out. They carry him home. A little while later, he dies. So, so the lady's like, well, what? go get Elisha. He's the one who did this. He's the one who said we we're going to have a kid. Go get him. So they get him. And he comes back, and she's like, why would you do this? Why would you give me a kid only to take him? You know, complaining and moaning, understandably, right? So, so listen, without getting into the details, you can read it. Elijah, through the power of God, he raises the kid from the dead. This is Elisha, right? This guy's awesome, right? This guy's awesome. Later on, he, there's another story in there. In 2 Kings chapter 4, this is an awesome chapter, right? Amazing chapter. It, it, he feeds 100 people a little sack of grain and 20 loaves of bread. And there's leftovers, it says. Sound familiar? Jesus, just to make sure nobody outdoes him, 
He doesn't use 20 loaves of bread. He feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, just to show everybody who's boss, right? Jesus is boss. But just good stuff here, man. Impressive resume. He gets the call on his life, and he goes and he actually serves the Lord, and great things happen. Plus, listen, it may, all this stuff made it to the Bible. I mean, do you imagine how much stuff has happened over the time that this stuff was written that didn't make it into the Bible? Great stories, great miracles, great situations, and it never made it to the Bible? I mean, I've had some great stuff in my life. You guys have too. None of that's making it to the Bible, y'all. This stuff made it to the Bible, so it must be super, super impressive, super important. So I think we can all agree that God used this farmer to do great things, for sure. And I'm super encouraged by that. I don't know about you, but I'm super encouraged by that, that God uses everyday Joes and Joannes to do great work. He used Elijah, the farmer, Peter, the fisherman, David, the shepherd, right? He's not going to to Harvard, and he's not going to the Trinity Evangelical schools, and he's trying to get those guys and those girls. No, he goes to the fishermen. He goes to the farmer. He goes to the shepherd, and he calls them to do great work, and he wants to do amazing things through their life. But the reason some of us don't get used to do great things, even though we know he calls regular folks like us right here in our church, He calls regular folks, but some of us aren't being used to do great things. And the reason why we don't see God work powerfully in and through our lives, we don't see the change that we crave so bad. And a lot of the times, it's because we didn't do what Elisha did. We didn't burn our bridges. We didn't burn our bridges. That's the title of our message this weekend. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. In our world today, we're told not to burn bridges, right? Isn't that what everyone always says? Don't burn bridges. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about every single one of us has connections and relationships and occupations and subscriptions and hobbies and relationships. It's just all the things that we're involved with in our lives, right? Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. But we have these these bridges. What these bridges are, are avenues, access back to these places. So, hey, listen, if you quit the job, make sure you put in your two weeks notice. Don't tick off the boss because you don't want to burn the bridge, right? Because you might need to go back there someday. You might, someday you might be really hurting and you need a job. So you want to make sure you don't tick that guy off. Don't aggravate that lady because if you burn that bridge, you'll never go back. You understand? If you have a relationship with someone, you don't want to be too offensive and too mean because you don't want to burn a bridge. Because you never know. 10, 15, 20 years later, Joseph, he's in in charge in Egypt, right? And you never know when someone's going to need to have something from you. So you don't want to burn a bridge. You might need something from them, right? And so we're told not to burn our bridges. But bridges aren't physical things like you see in the picture. Bridges are access back to someone or something or someplace. That's what a bridge is, right? They allow access back to something. It's a way back. But I found something else, too. I found that bridges are not only a way back for you, but it's a way for something bad to get back to you. Someone needs to hear that one right here, right now. That's what a bridge is, too. Do you know how many dr- people that, over the years of ministry, that struggle with alcohol and drug addiction, abuse? I'm not going to say addiction. I'm going to say abuse. They struggle with that, and you, and you talk to them about it, and they say, well, you know, I'm trying to do better, but it finds me. Anyone ever hear that? You ever hear that one before? It finds me. Really? Where are you hanging out? And with whom? You know, like, I understand that, that crack could show up anywhere, but there's, you're less likely to find a bunch of crack at choir practice and in your small group than in the bowling alley or at the bar. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so isn't it time that we just, like, stop making excuses and start making some good choices? Who are you hanging out with? 
You're, you're allowing access back into your life. That's a bridge you need to burn. Do you see what I'm saying? And a lot of people are not doing that. We need to burn our bridges. Now, Elisha is, this is powerful, man. He is no different than you. Elisha, all, listen, pre-chapter 4, Elisha is no different than either one of us, uh, any of us. He, he, you could be working in, look, Home Depot, right? You could be working at the sheriff's office. You could be working at the Circle K. You could be going to school. You could be at home raising your children. Elisha was just on the farm. He was just a farmer, and he wasn't even a special farmer. It says that there were 12 teams of oxen, and he was on the last team. He wasn't even the best. He wasn't the highest rated. He was on the last team on the farm. But he had a calling on his life. God was calling him. When Elijah came and put the cloak over that, he knew exactly what was happening. He knew exactly, and Elijah never said a word. Does it say he said a word? He put the cloak over him, and Elijah's like, I know what this is. I'm being called. And, and everyone in this room, within the sound of my voice right now, and if you're hearing me on Facebook, you, you hear his voice right now too. You know you've been called, you stubborn thing, and you resist and rebel. And Elisha knew the call, but he didn't. He didn't resist. He didn't rebel. He had a calling on his life. He was being called into kingdom work, away from the life that he was in, and into a new life. And listen up. God has called every one of his believers the same exact way. No different between Elisha and you. This should give you great hope. Listen, Ephesians chapter 4, this is what it says. This is what Paul wrote. Ephesians 4.1. You there? I don't think you're there. I think you're looking at me. Ephesians 4.1. Therefore, I, Paul, he says, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. Listen up. For you have been called by God. Could it get any clearer? You have been called by, look, this text right here, this one verse, we could preach the entire night on this. Here's the first thing I see there. And you can write this thing down if you want to. Calling doesn't always mean comfort, man. Calling doesn't mean comfort. I'm, I, I, listen, I've been doing this now for like 15 years, and I can't tell you how many times I've listened to people say things like, Listen, I'll know what I'm supposed to do when it works out, when, it's, when it flows, when it comes easily. If it's this much resistance, if it doesn't feel good, then it must not be God. Anyone ever heard that before? Have you said that before? Do you think Paul was comfortable? Do you think it felt good when he was in jail? How do you think those shackles felt on his on his, on his ankles and on his wrists. Do you think they felt good? Calling doesn't always feel right. See, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a feeling. We're looking for it to feel like this is what God wants me to do. How did it feel for Paul? A, like, he was following his calling. Hell or high water, I'm going to do what God said to do. And, and, and it's not comfortable. I'm in jail, man. I've been whipped and beaten. And put in jail with shackles on. Do you think that felt good? I think we need a lot less feeling and a lot more open it, read it, do it. When God says to do something, that's the call. And when you read something, you just do it. You don't ask. You don't wait for it to feel good. When, it, when you open the God's word and you read something that says you should do something or not do something. In this case, burn your bridges. And that's the calling on your life. Right now, clear from God. It's not something that you wait on, right? He says, I beg you. I be <laughs> Listen to the words of Paul. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. So there's a life that is representative of a true, authentic Christ follower. Right? Not fake, 
not half-hearted, not on the fence. Live a life worthy of the calling, for you've been called. And listen, for all those people that think everything, no matter whether it's good or bad, they say, well, it's okay. This is what God wanted. He, he, you know who's here tonight? Everyone that God wanted to be here. No. No. Why would Paul beg us to live a life worthy of the calling if everything that happens is exactly what God wanted? No problem. Do you have no input in this at all? You have no free will? No, 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 no personal responsibility? Why would, ba- why would Paul beg if everything is exactly what God wanted? You think that there's people that aren't here tonight that God wanted to be here? You think they're not here because God didn't want them to go and worship him? If everything is exactly the way God wanted it to be, why does it say in the Ten Commandments that I'm a jealous God? Come on now. <clears throat> I beg you to live a life. You have been called. Listen, when you're called to be a Christian, you are not just, not just saved from something. You're not just saved from from yourself, and you're not just saved from your sin, and you're not just saved from hell, although that is awesome, but when you've been called, you're not just saved from something, you're called to something. When, when mom called you at the end of the day from your house, remember? Christian, it's time to come home, right? What does that mean? It means two things. That means leave your buddy's house, right? But also, Come here. I want you to drop this, what you're doing here, and I want you to come over here. Right? That's what being called is. You're not just called from something. You're called to something. You dump one thing, one way of life. When God calls you into his kingdom work, you take your life that you had, whether it was good or bad. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying when he calls you to be a Christian, when he calls you to his kingdom to work for him now, you take your old life, you say, okay, that's done. Burn the bridge and do it this way. That's what he says to do. And see, many start strong. They get saved, they come to the altar, they get their first Bible, they start reading, and they start doing stuff for the Lord, but they sputter out in time because they didn't do what Elijah did at the Gideon. Burn the bridge. Burn the bridge from your old life. Burn it. Let's get specific now. Let's talk about what Elijah did. He's a farmer. He's out on the field. He's plowing, right? This is what he does. This is who he is, right? It's how he provided for himself. I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not a farmer. I don't know what that's like. I just know that every farmer who ever lived says they get up at four in the morning and milk cows. And I'm not about that. So I'm not a farmer. But he was a farmer. That's who he was. That's what he did. It was just his life. That's what he did. It was his identity. It was his provision. It was his occupation. That's what he was. And then God called. And we're the same. We all have a life. We all have a a way that we do things and how we do it. It's just who we are, right? All of us have that, even right now. And so, Elisha gets the call to change his life and to, 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 to alter what he's going to be doing. And so, we, let's look at his response there in verse 21. Well, if you look at the end of 20, Elijah tells him, Hey, listen, I want you to think about this, man. I, I want you to consider the calling. I want you to think about what I've done to you here. Think about this. Don't just make a knee-jerk reaction. Don't put it on. Think about this. And so look what he does. Elijah returned to his oxen, slaughtered them, used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. And then he arose and went with Elijah as his assistant. So I guess he actually thought about it, right? Elijah says, hey, I want you to consider your calling. Think about what I've done. And here's his response. He slaughters the oxen. He burns the plow. These are the things that, was his, that was his whole life, right? He was a farmer. That was his identity. That was his provision. That was his occupation. And he kills the oxen, burns the plow. Then he announces his decision publicly. I'm coming out. This is my coming out party. I'm not hiding. Look what he says he does. Does he go back to his parents? No, 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 no. 
he goes back in town, and he takes the oxen, and he has a big dinner for everybody. Look what it says. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. They had a big old banquet. He celebrated. Listen, this is my coming out party. I'm a Christ follower now. I, I've, I've changed my life, and this is who I am now. Listen, that's why we get baptized. Nobody, any, anybody in here a farmer with, with oxen that they could slaughter and pass it out to us all for a public announcement party? No, so we get baptized, right? We get baptized as a declaration. This is who I am now. I'm not the old person that I used to be. I'm someone new. If anyone's in Christ, the Bible says, they're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, the new person. And he comes out and he says, listen, this is who I am now, publicly. You know, it's hard to go back on your word when you announce it publicly. That's why a lot of people kind of don't want to say anything about Jesus to their friends. Because then you can't give anyone the finger anymore. And you don't want to put a revolution sticker on your car because then you can't cuss at people and you can't cut them off. Listen, we're joking. It's kind of funny, but it's so true. Like, I've had these conversations with you all. That's why a lot of people don't put a church sticker on their car because then, right, because when you, when you go public with this thing, it's a, lot, it's a lot harder to go back, right? Because now this is who I am. It's not a joke anymore. You're not in private. You've come out and you've announced what you are. And then look, he left it all behind. He killed the oxen, he burned the plow, and he left his town. Everything that he was, he was willing to give it up and leave. He burned his bridges. Listen, it's all he did right there is he didn't make it easy to return back to his old life. That's what he did. That's what I'm talking about. And we, we are like that all the time. We fall back into our old life and our old ways and our old identity. He, he didn't make it easy to go back to what he used to be. This is the husband who keeps his ex-girlfriend's phone numbers just in case. Oh, we're just friends. Bull crap you are. This is the new wife who keeps her own place still and keeps her own bank account just in case it doesn't work out. I can Make it difficult to, to, to not work out. Ma ma listen, if it's easy, if it's easy to go back, you'll go back. When divorce isn't on the table anymore, then it's a lot harder to go get one. So we don't want to keep the old, you, you, are you guys tracking with me? We don't keep the apartment. We don't keep the, the ex-girlfriend's phone numbers. If we're trying to quit this nasty habit of getting wasted all the time. We don't keep liquor in the cabinet there to tempt us. We don't keep a pack on the dash. And we don't keep hanging around with buddies that practice wickedness all the time, that that's who they are. No. Elijah wasn't that guy. He took his bridges, his access back to his old life, and his, all the temptations that could call him back or find him, he took them and he burned them and he left them behind. Do you ever wonder why you always end up in the same old sin? I'm, like, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but don't we all have like this one thing we just keep stinking doing all the time? God help me with this. 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 Do you have it? Come on, show me your hands. You don't have to say what it is, but you have it, right? Do you ever wonder why you keep going back there? Is it because God's too weak and he can't help you? No, it's because you didn't burn your bridge. That's why. If you have a problem with porn, take your phone and flush it down the friggin' toilet. If you have a problem with porn, take a hammer and smash the computer into a thousand pieces. Don't tell me that the computer is worth, oh, it's worth $500. Is that worth more than your soul? Do something. Burn the bridge. End the problem. Don't make it easy to go back all the time, right? We always go back to the same old sin, the same old practice, the same old life. People that, I see it all the time, they get arrested, they get arrested again and again and again and again. People who are taking drugs, they get arrested, they get drugs, 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 same thing all the time. Why? Because they didn't burn the bridge. They made an avenue of accessibility back into their life where the enemy could come and find you and hunt you down and roaring lion to devour, and he does. Burn the bridge. That's what we need to do. We need to burn our bridge. Listen, this is, this to me, I don't know what, how you feel, this to me is super powerful, but listen, like any lesson in the Bible, it doesn't matter if you like the story, 
It doesn't matter if you memorize the verses. That means nothing. The only power that comes from the Word of God is when you do the Word of God. Right? When you do what it says. And so we have to burn some bridges. What I learned, this is going to be a short message tonight. What I learned from this story, that living up to the calling that you've been called to is two things. One is total obedience. Total obedience. Not half-hearted, not kind of, sort of, woulda, shoulda. No, total obedience. What, what happens here? He gets the call, and what does he do? He burned the oxen, he burned the plow, he gets rid of all that stuff, and he says, see y'all later. He burned them, all of it. I'm done with that. He announces it, right? They have a party. They have a party. He doesn't just do it and say, hey, where's Elijah? Where's he been? I haven't seen him in a while. Where's Elijah? No, 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 no. He didn't do that. He gets up in front of the whole city, cooks a big banquet, and says, I'm done with that. I'm done with that now, right? And when you do that, like, much like baptism, when you get in the tank, you're saying to the church, hey, I'm now a Christ follower. So I am now subject to the word of God, and I am accountable to all of you. So if I mess up, I want you to come to me with the Bible and say, hey, this is what you're doing, and this is what God's word says. Chapter, verse, chapter, verse. We've, we've been down this road, right? That's what he's doing here. That's what Elijah's doing here. It's called, and they don't talk about it in church much anymore, good old word, it's called Repentance. You know, and I think in, in the church, in, here in America at least, and, and I've seen this, I've experienced this, that the word repentance is, it's just, it's, it's not used properly. Like, it's, we leave it short, like, of its real meaning. And, and often in the church, repentance, you know, you do something wrong, and someone, and with good intentions, say, well, did you repent? Did you repent? Did you tell God you were sorry? See, that's what, that's what it's turned into. It's turned into, tell God you're sorry. And although that is part of it, yes, right, it is that, but it's so much more. It's more like the story that we're reading. It's more like what Elijah did. He, he saw what his life was, and he made a decision to dump the old life and start the new life and let everybody know about it. Here's what repentance means. It means to change. It means to reconsider. In other words, hey, wait a minute, I used to think that this was okay to do, right? I was doing this all the time. Actually, I was really good at all this bad stuff. And, but now I'm reconsidering. Like, the Bible says, not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think, right? So we reconsider what we think. Hey, I used to think this was good, but now I don't think that is good. Now I think this is good. We go through the definition of repentance it's change it's reconsider it's turn i used to do this right but now i'm doing this it means to think different and to do different it's 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 this it's i've been i've been going through my life my all these years with this and i've been carrying this around with me this is my life with all my sin and my bad habits and all my bad relationships and my past failures, and I've been trying to, to live this new life, but I can't because I'm carrying all this junk with me, and I'm trying to live the Christian life, but I also have this stuff, and I won't let go. But if we want to do what's right, we have to do like what Elijah said. We have to take the stuff, and we have to burn it. That's what we need to do. I won't do this. You'll get all wet, too. I don't want to ruin the blue. <clears throat> Listen, we have to get rid of all this junk. A lot of us are not moving forward because we can't let go of the past. It's, a, it's too heavy, and we're trying to do this. But Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you throw that stuff down, and you pick up your cross, and you follow me. You turn from this stuff over here, and you turn to Christ, and you follow him. Right? That's what repentance is. Not just saying, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. No, no, no. You change the way you think. You stop doing this, you burn it, you leave it in the past, and then you pick up your cross and you follow Christ. That's what repentance really is. So you say, I'm done with this. And listen, it's not just total obedience. It's not just that. It's immediate obedience. There's no room in this for, I'll wait till next week. 
Okay? That's not the way God works. It says here in the story, after he kills the cows and burns the plow and has the party announcing, I'm done with that, then he, like, listen, he pushed his seat out from the table and he got up and he left with Elijah. You know when it starts? Now. Not waiting till next, till tomorrow, not next week, not next month. No, now, right? Not New Year's Eve. We're not like easing into things. No toe in the water. No, no scaling back on my sinful old habits. No, all the time, right now, no flirting with fire. I'm in, I'm done with that, and now I'm following Jesus. I've changed who I am. That's your decision. Paul said it perfectly in Philippians 3. I really want you to go there, please. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Would you go there? So, so Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. This is what he says in Philippians 3 about this same topic. This is how it's done. Paul says, one thing I do, like there's a lot of things that he does, but one thing he does, and he does it well, forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what is behind. Does that mean, see, what, well, when I read that, when I was reading that time and time again over the years, I probably felt the same way that you do. That means you just forget about it, like it's out of your mind. But again, don't sell yourself short. Don't sell the Bible short. It's not just that. It's forgetting what's behind, meaning this stuff, like, I'm done with this. I'm done with this. It's not so much that I, I'm not, I, I, I forgot about it. It's, 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 I'm done with that, right? So I, I'm not thinking about it anymore. I'm not talking about my old self anymore. I'm not entertaining the possibility of going back to my old self anymore. This is what I said I was going to do, and this is what I'm going to do, right? I've set my face like stone, determined to do his will. That's what God's word says. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, listen, and listen to the words that he uses, and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God, listen, called me. There it is again. Called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So think about the words that Paul uses. I forget this stuff in the past. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I'm not talking about it anymore. I'm certainly not doing it anymore. I'm not going back there anymore. I've burned this bridge, and now what am I doing? I'm straining toward the goal. What does that look like to you? What does that look like to you? Doesn't it look like a runner, right, at the end of the race, and he's just trying so hard, and he sticks his chest way out because he just wants to get there. It, it's, it's initiative. It's, it's exerting energy. It's intentional. I'm going for this thing. I'm not just, just waffling back and forth. Yeah, I gave my life to Christ, and you know, I'll serve him sometime. Whatever way the wind blows, you know, if the wind's blowing towards Home Depot, I'll go to church that night. And, and maybe, you know, if it's blowing towards Ramon's study, maybe I'll go to that thing. But no, 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 no. He's, he uses intentional words. Straining toward, pressing on toward, like intentional. That's your will, your decision. This is what I'm doing now. I've given up on that stuff. I'm not doing it anymore. I've cut off access For the devil to get to me and for me to get to this junk, I'm done with that. I'm going in a new direction. That's what we need to do. And again, I don't think people can move forward because they're, they can't let go of the past. You know, if bad company, it's a big one, if bad company corrupts good character, then who are you hanging out with? I mean, if you want to live the life that Christ called you to, that, you know, that, heavenward call think about the heavenward call being like him right if that's what he's called you to then why are you still hanging out with buddies that do wrong say wrong drink wrong smoke wrong cuss wrong teach wrong all kinds of wickedness they're not calling you heavenward they're calling you to the gutter and so we need to burn 
the bridge. Listen. Whatever is getting in the way of your victory in Christ, you need to burn it. Whatever is causing you to repeat that same sinful pattern over and over again, that you've said, God, would you take that away from me? Don't ask God to help you to quit smoking and put a dash on your dashboard a pack of smokes. Don't put the sin right in front of your face. How many times can you be on a diet and, so, and, and then Kim comes in with a chocolate cake from Publix? I'm on a diet. Awesome. Well, I'm just going to put this right here, this chocolate cake from Publix, to remind you of what that would do to you. I'll tell you what it's going to do to me as I'm feeding my face with that thing. How long till you give in? Right? If you're trying to, to change the way you live and you try not to go out and, and drinking and smoking and cussing and partying and having bad things with grown-up stuff, right? Who are you hanging out with? Are you hanging out with the people that are doing that? And don't tell me you're there to minister to them. They're ministering to you. We have to burn our bridges. Does anyone in this room know who Scott Chapman is? There's only one person in this room that might, yeah. Mikey knows who Scott Chapman is. Let me tell you who Scott Chapman is. It's a really cool story. So Scott Chapman, well, S Michael's brother and our old worship pastor here, um, Kyle, he works for this man now at a church that he planted in 1994. So Scott Chapman, it's called the chapel. They have about 8,000 people. They're up there in the suburbs of Chicago. They have about six or seven campuses all together, right? This guy planted a church in 1994. But let me tell you a little bit about Scott. Let me talk about, let me, t let me share with you a story, an awesome story about burning bridges, okay? This guy was in medical school. He's a brilliant man, going to medical school to be a doctor. Is that a good cause? Doctors are good, right? Doctors are great. Thank God for doctors, right? We all need doctors. So he's going, to, he's going to medical school, and it's going pretty well, except he senses God calling him. Uh-oh, right? Uh-oh. So you know what he does? He burned his bridge. He went in for his final. He knew that this is what God wanted him to do, to go plant the church. He went into his final. The teacher handed him, the professor handed him the paper, the test. He went back to his desk. He wrote his name on it and handed it in. He wanted to make sure he got a zero so when he flunked out, he would no longer ever be eligible to be accepted into a medical school again. That's burning your bridge. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what we need to do. This burn your bridge mentality, this burn your bridge approach is not exclusive to Elisha. We see it again as we finish up our evening together here. We see it again in Acts chapter 19. Would you turn there, please? Acts chapter 19. We're going to be reading in just a moment a little bit of the story, but just context in 19. This is where um, Paul is in Ephesus. He's preaching boldly for months and says that everyone in Asia Minor they heard the word of the Lord. Must have been pretty big crowds. Um, people are coming to the Lord like crazy. Uh, God gave Paul the power to perform insane miracles, so much so that when his, this is crazy, when his snot rag touched someone, they were healed. Okay? Crazy. But that's the power that God was displaying through this man of, of radical obedience. And so... He, he's healing people. He's boldly preaching. And I love this. This, this, is, this is really, really cool before we get to the part we need to study. But there's a story right between what I just told you about with Paul preaching and performing miracles and then the part we're going to read. There's this part where, where there's this demon and he's, he's really nasty. And, and these, these seven sons of Sceva, this guy's name is Sceva, and his sons, they come, they try to cast the demon out, and the demon's like, yeah, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but like, who are you? And the demon jumps on all seven of them, they're in this house, and he jumps on all of them, and beats them, 
so bad that they run out of the house naked. Like, that's when you get beat up real bad, right? How would you like to make the Bible finally, and it's because you got beat up so bad that the demon beat the clothes off of you? That's like a really bad story, but I love the story. It's pretty funny. But anyway, so we get through that, and we see in, in chapter 19 over in uh, verse 18, it's, so they're preaching the gospel. Paul's preaching the gospel powerfully, right? Performing miracles, preaching boldly. And it says many who became believers, right? They confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery bought their, brought their incantation books. These are the sorcery books, okay? These are the Harry Potter books. And he says that they brought these books and burned them at a public bonfire. Listen, the value of the books was several million dollars. So for the guy, remember a few minutes ago I said if you have a trouble with porn, put a hammer to your, to your computer, put a hammer to your big screen TV, and you're like, oh, I don't want it because it was worth $300. These books were worth millions of dollars. But their, their, their accepting of the call of God was so strong that the money didn't mean anything anymore. It's a priority. It's a value statement, right? What's more important to you? And so it says that they burned them several million dollars worth. And w watch this. This is, this is, this is awesome. This, now we're talking church here, right? So the message about the Lord, because of this, the message of the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Now listen. Is that what we're looking for in our church? We, we want our church, the message of the gospel that comes out of this church, to spread widely and powerfully, right? How do you get that? You get that by burning your bridges, right? That's how you get it. They believed, right? They believed. Come on up here, guys. They believed. They accepted the call, right? And then what did they do? Like Elijah. Elijah. They burned their books. They didn't keep them in the, in the you know, I, I just keep my, my, my Koran and I'll keep my Hindu books and my, and my Scientology books. I'll keep those in my, in, because I want to study about other world religions. Listen, that corrupts your mind, right? You don't keep that stuff. No, you know what you do? You burn it. You burn it. Right? You make a decision of your will that I'm no longer doing this anymore. Now I'm following Christ now. Right? And he only has one book. And so I'm going to burn the rest of the stuff. Get rid of all that junk. I'm going to confess. He says that they confessed their sin. Right? That means they repented. They, 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 they rethought what they were thinking. Like, I used to do this, but now I, I realize, listen, publicly it says that that stuff was wrong. And I shouldn't do that anymore. I'm not doing that anymore. And so they burned the books. Publicly, they announced. Publicly, I am now a Christ follower. I'm no longer the person that I used to be. I no longer do the things I used to do. I no longer say the things I used to say. I no longer get involved in the things I used to get involved with. No, no, no. That stuff is gone. And what happens? The gospel spreads powerfully, right? Do you have any idea? Now it gets personal. Do you have any idea of the impact that you yourself can have when you make a powerful public announcement of your change? Like You may never thought of this before, of, of the power of one person. Listen, Elijah was a farmer. I'm not ripping farmers, right? But that's not Bill Gates. That's not the president. That's not LeBron James. He's a farmer. And these guys, these just, just people, and listen, unnamed people. People that weren't even named in the Bible. That's how unimportant they were. God's word uses names all through it, doesn't it? But they're not even named. And these unnamed people, unimportant people, made a powerful public profession of their faith in Christ. And what happened as a result? The gospel spread like wildfire, didn't it? You see it there in the text. I didn't make it up, right? So I just want to say that I want to do this. I want to make one offer to you. And remember, when I made this offer, remember the value of the books. 
that were burned. Oh, I can't do that. They're worth a lot of money. They're worth a lot of money. I can't do that. I can't do that. How about Elijah's oxen? How about his plow? That's how he provided for himself, right? That was his identity. That was everything that he had. And he burned it as a public profession of his faith in Christ. A public declaration is powerful. And if you want to be part of spreading the gospel to this world, it's time to burn some bridges.